Hi, Anametta. Hi, Mike. It's good Hi. to see you. Great, great to see you. Good to see you. And I hope everybody who is watching is finding a way of coping in this uh, strange situation. Yes. We, we, I, so many things to talk about with you, and I'm not altogether certain where we start. What, what, where, where do we start with, with what we chat about? What do you well, think? Well, I just opened uh, the kiln yesterday, and uh -huh. I've been looking at pots today. It's not easy the first day of looking at pots, but um, firing was okay. Yes. Things to change and things to keep for in the in the room and some to ship to you. Okay, so maybe later on um, in the chat we'll have a look at. Did you bring some of those pieces in with you? I have, yeah. yeah. Fan some. Fantastic, so that we can have a look at some of those. Mm. I'm trying to remember how long we've been working together. Yeah, well, me too. <laughs> it's. It's 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 a long time for me. It's it feels a little bit like forever, I think. But uh, I I met you first time um, in England at Rufford because I was I attended the, the pottery fair in Rufford many times. I loved going there, meeting British potters and selling pottery. And then you came and bought some pots and I, I wasn't sure who you were. You bought a lot of pots, but then I realized that you were my gold market. And then you asked me to bring more pots uh, the next year. And uh, so I came back with my pots in a box that was shipped to, to Rufford. And then I was wheeling down my suitcase and my tent down, walking down to this. And then um, you asked me if I wanted to do a show in your gallery, and I said, no. I remember, because it was, uh, that was, it was too scary. I, I, see, I seem to remember that it took nearly three years to persuade you to show with us. Yes, it did. Yeah. Most people, I only have to ask, not even once, and they want to show here. But you know what is? Um, uh, I work with Phil Rogers. Yes. And uh, he's a very dear friend, and and I I learned a lot, but also I learned how difficult it is to to uh, make good pots. You know, the standard in the in his studio on his shelves and, and um, the pots that he has in his collection are just unbelievable. And he, he was selling work in your gallery. So it, was, it wasn't right uh, for a student to, to sell pots in the same gallery. And I think also what people don't know is that you are, you, you, you tell that you are gallery and uh, shop, pot shop, but it's not, it's not. It's nowhere near what Goldmark Gallery really is. So it makes it really um, complicated to be alone with the decision to say it. But you know, obviously, <laughs> I was really, really. Um, I said yes, and um, it's unbelievable to to have this. I know I'm. I'm lucky. I know I'm really, really lucky to be able to. Stay on this tiny little island. It's, it's very windy today, and um, stay in my studio and make pots and ship the pots. Did, did, did you did you always want to be a potter? Yes, but I never ever thought that I could make a living from it. It wasn't uh, something in my. You know, I'm from a family where uh, everything is homemade, handmade. My dad was a carpenter and my mother made all the tools and everything, the food and everything, but we didn't know any artists. And I thought that this is, you know, there was, I, so I didn't have this in my head to be able to make a living from only selling pottery. And I, I was a teacher in a, it's called a Danish folk high school for many years. 
um, teaching ceramics, and I really love the combination. But I, I am. Um, it's not enough. Phil said that to me also. He said told me many good things. Uh, he said that you know you you have to do that a hundred percent if you want to if you want to become a potter you have to live and work as a potter. So yeah, I do that now. I've done that for quite a while. We we both owe Phil a great debt, I think. We do. A, a great debt because he I have to tell you that he was he was the first person we showed and he has been um, and even when you were an apprentice I remember with him I remember him telling me about you and um, saying how how much he admired what you were already able to do but um, we have He's been unfailingly generous in terms of both his support and um, encouragement and his knowledge, which is fantastic. And I think you you rely on him a lot too, don't you, with some of the technical things that. Yes, every time I have a disaster, it happens a lot of disasters here, yeah, and especially when you try to walk a new path in this world of pottery. There are many disasters, and I don't use Google. I use Bill Rogers. Yes, <laughs> he would be very, he would be pleased to <laughs> hear that. that. That's lovely. Yeah. But we had our first show, and it was very successful, and people just loved what you did. Mm. And we made this. I thought was a wonderful film that um, when Jay came over to uh, to Born Home. And then that extraordinary thing that we, we make this film and we work in this little shop in the middle of nowhere and you're working in a cow shed on, on an island in Bornholm. Yes. And, and it goes on Danish television and was, and was seen by your wonderful queen. Yeah, well, <laughs> it was the, the queen of Denmark, she's 80 this next week so right. congratulations and uh, see see it's it's not that rare to have a visit from uh, the queen of denmark it's a uh -huh. long tradition that she has on her boat visited different places in denmark on a summer tour trip um and that year when was that it was after my first exhibition with you she visited Bornholm, and then from many choices, she she wanted to come and see the our studio and the kiln and and so we she was here for she was supposed to be here for I think fifteen minutes but when they were about to leave she actually said she wanted to have another look in in my studio and to see the pot so we are a little proud that she spent seven minutes longer than she was. <laughs> Johnny, have you got a clip of that <laughs> that you can show? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, someone's just given me um, a piece of paper that's, that's just come in. Some great comments already. That, you know, we wonder when we do a thing like this whether anyone watches us. And we've already got comments from New York, Florida, South Africa, India, Berlin, Holland. Isn't that extraordinary? Absolutely extraordinary. We're all doing well. So that that's um, uh, that visit and the showing of the film which we made, and I think um, some of our viewers saw that yesterday. Um, and then I got a uh, a call from someone in America who'd seen it, mm. and they wanted to know about you and have an article um, which we. We, we then organized and and the next thing we were selling your pots in the states which was amazing mm -hmm. but the i remember you saying to me how important um your trip to mashiko was mm -hmm. do you want to tell us because we've long had a relationship with mashiko and um the great ken matsuzaki but how long did you go out there for well i was there for three months uh, and, but, but that's the thing with with pottery. It's a it's a small community, really. You know, 
I know potters from everywhere in this world, and it's not rare. It's it's just it's a wonderful community pottery community. So I've been many places and visited many people. I'm not too proud of all this flying. Actually, we have to do something about that. But anyway, I in 2000 and oh somewhere back, I met uh, a, a Japanese potter. Iwami Shinsuke in, in uh, South Korea, actually. And for some reason, later on, then he he was invited to show some pottery on Bornholm, and I asked if he wanted to come. And um, I had, <laughs> that was when I, when I moved to the farm where I am now, I had built, I built a two-chamber kiln because that had been my dream for many, many years. And, um and then I by it, I wasn't meant to start working with glazes because I've done salt glazing for many years and I've just been thinking to add this first chamber and work with the same slips and the few S glazes that I've been working with in the first chamber, realizing that it's not just like works when you do that, not knowing anything about glazes and about firing and the body gamma. So uh, it was it was amazing to be able to so Mashiko has a ceramic museum and they they had opened they have now a residency studio where you can apply and I was really lucky to be able to go there for three months. And you have to write a project. And I wanted to go and learn from Japanese pottery about these uh, simple glazes, ash glazes, stonework glazes. And it's, I think it's the best place in the world to go and study this. Also because there is so many potters in Mashiko who uh, opening doors for you and I could put my pots in different pots of kilns and we spent so many visits with Ken Matsusaki and he's uh, he's also just so kind to share information about all sorts of things. So I spent three months in Mashiko uh, trying to understand places. And it, it's it's much it I'm on I'm on the right track. I'm not anywhere near any destination, but it somehow it started a, an ongoing project between Ivami Shinsky, me, and this ceramicist that I share a studio with about working with local materials, and that has been really really interesting. But also that starts new questions about um, what is a, you know, when is, so this is from the firing that came out yesterday. And I think it, this is one of my favorites from this firing, but the glaze is, this is from a very cool, cold spot in the kiln and the glaze is um, quite soft. So I'm not sure this is gonna, uh, this, this rim, the, the glaze might not be strong enough. And there's all these other questions that I'm not used to having worked with salt glaze for many, many years, which is a completely different world. Now I'm getting a little too technical, I, think, I can feel. Some, somebody, they've just come up with a, a question. Somebody, they're talking to us live um, and people are passing me questions which we're being asked. And there's, there's one of them here from a gentleman called Andrew. And he writes, I have two of your bottles, which to me represent autumn and winter. And then he says, I wondered how much effect the changing seasons have on your life as a potter in terms of making and decorating. Um, and I think he shows us, I don't know whether you can see, someone's passed me. This is the winter pot um, below. I always think of a flat landscape with snow laden clouds and the remains of last year's growth peeking through at the bottom. And I wonder whether I can, I don't know whether, whether well, it's thank possible. Thank you very for much for having one of my pieces. Well, oh, 
this is where I live. And uh, I hope you can't hear my dog because it's his uh, walking time now <laughs> around five o'clock. He's I put him outside, but so I walk with him two times a day. And when you are in the countryside, it is autumn, winter, summer, and spring. So that's what I see every day. But you know, I'm a, I'm not a potter who tries to invent new things. Definitely not. I think I might be the kind of person to, who tries to understand you know what's around me the place where I live and work and and um, and looking down in the materials here you know I'm walking on pure clay every day so of course I wonder about you know to but anyway so uh, but there is this I think I don't know but there is a painter who lived from 1877 to 1943. His name is Klaus Johansen. And he used to be a hidden gem. Not many people knew about him until recently. And he is my uh, hero. He's, he was a painter here. He was self-taught and very poor. And he didn't know, um, well, he wasn't part of the established. But uh, anyway. I think people ought to look him up and then they will understand a lot. So tell us his name again. Klaus Johansen. Okay. Yeah, I gave, I have a, I had a book, but I gave it away. So I, I'm sure, I'm sorry, I can't show it. Uh, yeah, that's it. Well, the other thing is that on the piece that you showed, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of, you know, there's another one here. It's the, yes. There's a lot of vertical. Vertical is this way, right? Yes. No, that's horizontal. Is it? That's horizontal. That's okay. Right. Well, <laughs> there is this. If you are a potter, there is never ending this throwing lines. And um, if you just do one like this, you have a landscape. It's that simple, really. And for me, at least, it's easier to look at all the details on a uh, on a glaze or uh, well details details in general when you are working with these kinds of glazes and materials there's a lot of details but for me it's easier to see them if there is this what you call vertical line yes that just emphasizes it so i've just been passed another question which i'll i'll read to you um this, this is from um, a wonderful lady called Anne Dean, who's a great, great customer of ours, comes up um, regularly with her husband. And, and she says, I have a question, um, if you think it's worth asking, bless her. I'm trying to remember if Anna Meta ever actually met Gutta Eriksson, but I definitely know she admired her. What was she like and what was the most useful thing she learned from her? Well, I wish I, re, I wish I had met her in re, or, or re. I spoke to with her to her on the phone for an hour or something like that. Right. I, see, I was working with Bill. We're back with Bill Rogers now, right. and he decided that it was a good thing for me to do a lecture in at the Abriswith Festival wow. about Danish contemporary ceramics. Wow which meant that I could get a free ticket. So I said yes, and it was a bad, bad idea because then I actually had to do this lecture, but it gave me the opportunity to, to um, call Danish potters to have some pictures and some information that I could share with people in every street. And I called Gute Eriksen and she picked up the phone and then she sent me this is her, can you oh, see? Wow. It's her, I found just before, thank you Anne for bringing, bringing this back out. So it's the lecture given by Gude Eriksen in February, 2003. She sent me this for my um, talk in Everest. And um, I think, uh, so there's another thing because last year, I had a group of uh, theatre people from Copenhagen, the Royal Theatre. They came here to spend the day with me. And then this woman, 
her mother was her, was a neck. See, this is a pottery world. It's very amazing. Uh, well, this piece. Can you see how big it yeah. is? Yeah, yeah. This is good eggs, and she had it from somebody else, and she decided that since. I'm a big fan of Goody Eriksen, and I didn't have a piece of Goody Eriksen, so I should have it. It's cracked and glued together, luckily, because otherwise I would never have it. <laughs> and that gives me a possibility to learn so much from Goody Eriksen, because she has used local clays, of course, because she's from the generation before me. And she, of course, came to Bornholm to use clay because this is where the good clay is. So every time I look at this piece and pick it up, it gives me a lot of information about texture and uh, uh, material. Oh, it's deep. Oh, I'm so, it's really difficult to see them talk in front of the screen. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, wish, I wish it was, uh, okay, anyway, I hope, have I have I missed it? No. I have to tell Hello? you, yeah. I have to tell you, you are doing brilliantly. Okay. And, and um, they've just given me another bit of paper here for, with another question, which I'll ask you in a moment. But more comments now from Switzerland, from Italy, from Canada, from Russia, from Bornholm, from USA. That, that's amazing. Um, here's a question from DS, I don't know who that is. I have a question if it's okay. In the documentary, you talk about, now I, I can't say this because I think it's written in Danish, at gore sig umage, to go out of your way. Oh, at gore sig umage, yes. Yes. Yeah. It was a fascinating approach. Could you say a little bit more about it? About it, at gore sig umage. Oh, that's a difficult one, yeah. Well, yeah, because I think, mm, gosh, oh, I have to think about this now. But, uh, but that, it, I think it, it just, but to Gaza Ume, if you have to explain the phrase, I think it might, but it has to hurt, you know, you have to get out where it hurts, where it's not comfortable. Right. It's like being when you, it's not easy to do all this with all this, and then there is no, no, it's, ah, oh, it goes, yeah, to make yourself a bit uncomfortable. We, ha we, we have a phrase, um, and I wonder whether it's the same sort of thing, and, and that's to, to go out of your comfort zone, to do yeah. things which are awkward and maybe difficult, but like expand the boundaries of what you're doing. Is that? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Mark. Is that, is that what is that the sort of thing it means? Yeah. I've got another question that's just come in. They're coming in fast and furious. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, someone called Jim asked, "Will you make more porcelain, or are you addicted to local clay?" <laughs> We're actually planning to, because uh, I built a new little kiln oh. you, with all these. Uh, trying to understand stoneware glazes, then we decided to build a small wood kiln a few years back. Yes. And it works much better when firing porcelain. So I'm gonna do a firing in three weeks, uh, a porcelain firing. And then the local clay is uh, in the bottom part of the kiln. And then porcelain is higher temperature. So I will keep you updated, Mike. Very good. And, and I wonder, um, you have your next exhibition with us in November. Mm. So maybe we'll see some of these pieces then. Yeah. I've got, I've got another question that's coming. Feels like tomorrow this exhibition in November. Does it? And this is from someone called Mary, who okay. says, I wonder if Anna Meta could say a little more about how she turns her lovely thrown cylinders even into even more beautiful oval shaped casseroles. In the documentary, she mentioned that her casseroles are normally oval and showed how she likes to decorate them with stamps. But the step of going from round to oval was not shown. 
Um, I suspect, she says, that the main requirements for making perfect oval vessels is years of practice leading to great skill, but she'd be interested to know how you do this, how you go from a... Okay, so I managed to read the question a little few minutes before okay. we were here, so I've done a little, a little, this is um, cardboard, if this yep. was clay, you know, pretend this is clay and it's round, and I do it, you can do it in many different ways, but I choose the simple way. So when this is leather hard, it means when it's uh, firmed up, but not dry. Uh, when you can, and that's, it's not difficult. And then I cut it off the back that it sits on. From, I take it from the wheel and then leave it for some hours until it's firmed up by itself. So it's exactly the same softness or leather hard. Um, feeling everywhere and then what you do now I'm going to show it like this then you just squeeze it together it's it's simple and then you put it on the base which is here so you this is a piece of clay and you kind of draw draw the oval on this piece of clay and then you do a lot of scratching with a knife and put some um, um, slip on it Put it back on and leave it there for the following day and then you can cut the base off um, and scrape it till you get this um, so you have it upside down oh, and yes. then, then then this part is the is the part where you can then decide how you want it to look i just take my thumb and then I do like this, so you have a little bit of an edge that can catch uh, you yeah, that can catch a drip. If, for instance, you use a very runny glaze, like this is a glaze made from granite, bonham black granite, and uh, wood ash from the stove, from the kitchen. It's mainly hardwood, and then so. If you're lucky, then the rim catches the drip so it doesn't stick the pot to the council. But it's so it's not a difficult uh, process, but what what takes years of experience is to find the right mm, when it's not too wet or not too dry. And then it's to find out how you like the rim. You know, I've decided that I have a rim that has an inner oval shape and then it faces, fades down. Oh, I'm sorry about my Danish pigeon English. Uh, you're, but you're, it makes I have it to tell, I have to tell you, your English is wonderful. <laughs> yes, okay. Well. But it makes it strong if you have um, an extra thickness down here. Right. But it, yeah. But you don't want it to look lumpy, right? So that's all the discussions you keep having with yourself. And then the tricky thing is also when to attach the handles, because yeah. if you do it, if it's too soft, they're going to change shape in the firing. Uh, but if, if it's too hard, it starts cracking. So it's it's not difficult. The process is not difficult, but it's it's hard to find the exact the right time to do it. I hope it was. Otherwise, it's very... She can write me if she yes. I remember you saying to me, I'm not sure we maybe caught it on film um, some time back, how careful you have to be when you make a pot because people will put food in it. Yes. And I just, I work with some privileged, here we are to work with some amazing potters I've never heard a potter say that before, and I just thought that was extraordinary. Your real caring about what you do and the pots that you make, so that they 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 serve the food that people are gonna are gonna have. Yeah, but we 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 use the pots. We know that. We I do that. I use the pots that are easiest or best or most comfortable or are good for the thing that you want to use it for. There's a lot of competition in the kitchen. And then I don't know. 
is another question just come in from India. Um, and this chap asks whether you would talk more about the, your responsibility when firing or making. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I feel bad about it. You feel uh, bad about it? Yeah, well, well it, the, the whole thing right now with this world makes me think like, oh, well, probably many other people, but uh, I should, you know, it's, I should work with wood, I should, but um, it's not an easy thing, is it? It's not an easy question. It's a good question. It's a question that you ask yourself all the time because, because I, I see how much fuel I use every time I fire the kiln. I actually see how much clay I use and then I live on an island that has been a production island for more than 200 years and I the the, the we have one granite quarry that is still in in use and it's huge it's enormous it's not a bad thing for the world to have a hole in the ground it doesn't do anything harmful but it's still it still make luck definitely it should do it makes me feel wow Oh my God! If we do a, it's a, the footsteps we make. They, they, uh, they change things. Yes. Yes. How did the 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 fire? You've just finished the firing, mm. and you've been unpacking the kiln. Yes. How 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 has that gone? Well, so there are. Some parts for the gold mark room that you will have in October, and there is. Then I chose a selection of uh, pots that I will send you next week. There are some marks, different marks with different. From this is the, this is what I've been working. This is the slip and the combination of the clay and the slip and the salt firing that I've been working on many years, and then these are some of my new adventures with the first chamber, um, the Tenmoku place, and then there is another mark with, uh, with the runny granite glaze that I'm still trying to, to get to know. So in the beginning, I because this is a soft place, so I it changes inside. It doesn't matter, but it the glaze changes over time. So I'm wondering if it's okay, if people think it's okay or not. But now I've decided that I'm not glazing it inside since it is salt glaze. So it's it doesn't actually have to have a glaze inside. So this is where I'm at at the minute with this. And then there are some, these are some of the local clay pieces from the first chamber. This is, this is, this is this is the this is the uh, red clay uh -huh. mixed with uh, something else. And see, this is good Eriksson's uh, beaker. Same. Can you see? No, you yes. it's not good enough for you to see that. It, yes, 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 we can. Yes. Are in the same family, and yes. uh, it feels good to be related. So she says this in her speech. She says that you could say roughly that pottery is teamwork throughout the ages. Isn't that beautiful? That's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. So I learned, I hope I learned. From That's really nice. Um, someone's just given me another question. Uh, and they ask what your favorite form is to make, what you like making best. Yeah, so that I, I could say oval dishes because I'm very comfortable with them. I've yeah. been a, through a lot of them, so about the proportions, I could say teapots because that's always uh, I always thought since uh, you know I was lucky that we had ceramic ceramics in primary school, and we had the teacher. It's still here in my head saying, yeah, "You will never be able to make a teapot." That's what he said. So I'm still thinking that it's difficult to make a teapot. Still difficult to make a teapot because there's so many pieces that have to fit together. So I really like a lot when 
it works. Uh, then there is the the bottles, the ones that you I see you have in the background. I love making them because it's a little bit like a to have a break, to take a break. I find it difficult to be a potter throwing on the wheel because you have to pay full attention. You know, to pay honest attention to Gaza Ume all the time in the process. Uh, but with the with the press molded pieces, you can relax a little bit because the, I made the press mold beforehand and then it's the canvas you can play around with. So I love them because it takes the pressure off sometimes. We, we, were, we had a, a private chat on the phone the other day and um, we had, because I'm confined to my home uh, with Fiona and, uh, and son Ruben at the moment, um, we just had a lunch and we had uh, water from one of your beautiful jugs and I mentioned it to you. Mm. And you said you were not sure about making jugs anymore. I think it's the most difficult thing to make. Instead. Do you? Yes, I haven't learned that yet. So it's on my, on my future list of uh, locking myself in my studio for a long time to learn how to make a good job. Yes. I think you've already made some wonderful jugs and if, if one day you're going to make even better, I can hardly wait. Yeah. But I look forward to that. But you know, I had a really strict teacher who is a master at making jugs. Right? Oh, yes. <laughs> the pressure on you. <laughs> yes. Yes, well, he, he made some amazing jugs, didn't he? And makes, yeah. Yeah. Did you make some, did you, did you put some tiles in this? Uh, yes, box? I did. Um, what was that about? So the, the thing is that, oh, yeah, I can't see I've never seen you make tiles. Okay. Can you see, I can see there is a, it's a new kitchen, it's very messy, but uh, we had to change the kitchen because, because we had uh, too many rats living here with us. It's not okay. Good. So, <laughs> and then I decided I wanted to um, make tiles, of course. They are here. And then I happened to put some on Instagram that I just learned. It's an amazing thing, Instagram. And then I had a, I had a, an email from Vicky, who works with you. Wonderful Vicky. In gold my gallery asking yeah. if I could do some tiles so I wonder if I will ever have tiles in my kids I hope not because then I hope it's because I can send them but I have made as I think there is so far two square, two square meters of tiles but they 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 are not easy because they walk and they take time off yeah but it's yes I have made a lot of tiles in this firing too this is um this is another one that I'm gonna maybe have to focus on a little bit because this is a this is a new I've made this mold. It's a pestle and mortar. You haven't had any of these at all because I have to test. No. Them first. Wow, it's very heavy. The trouble is I'm very bad cook, so I don't use a pestle and mortar. I do. I don't remember you being a very bad cook. I remember you being a very good cook. So I might have to send this prototype to you, Mike. Okay, we'll try it. And then we have to do some teamwork here. You have yes. to tell me if it, if it works well yes. or if it's just a piece of a heavy stone. Yes. This is also the clay. This is from the bottom of the kiln. And it's a, you know, that's the thing if you, that's that's a trouble here now is that you can see I have too many, too many, too many glazes and too many types of clay and um, two kilns like I have a salt chamber and I have a chamber with stoneware glazes and then we built the small test kiln that we find really good for other things. And what I must do is to narrow down 
And that's, that's the most difficult part, actually. Yes. Yes. You know, we've, we've now chatted. We were going to talk for half an hour, and we've already chatted for 40 minutes. And okay. I guess we could talk forever. We've I had... We've had I've enjoyed it hugely. And um, uh, I can see from the number of people who've watched from all over the world and the questions have come in. It's terrific. Um, we've also been asked to show the film again. Okay. After this broadcast, so. Um, uh, but you, can I say just one last uh, thing? Is please, that please. because of this lockout in in the world in Denmark, we're we're coping with the uh, copying Italy a little bit, I think, because they started singing together. Yeah. Separate or apart together, separate together, and we're doing that in Denmark because we have this folk high school tradition. With there is a. Uh, we have a collection of folk songs in this, in this song book and um, every Friday evening uh, Denmark sings together it feels a little bit like this, this because you tell me that uh, the people from all around the world watching this so this pottery world that, that um, you know we can meet this way is yes uh, is it? Yes. yes yes it's been great chatting with you and I look forward to the next lot of pots coming across yeah. and, and seeing you in person later on during the year when we have the exhibition. Yeah. Just hope that things are, yeah, have, yeah, that we will meet in. Yes, that things are different then. I've enjoyed it hugely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. And Speak again soon. Bye. Bye. Mixing clay, mixing glazes, cleaning the workshop every now and then, cleaning pots after firing. I had the best time in my life and I learned a lot. He is an extremely good teacher, Mr. Rogers. Yeah. And also later, um, after I graduated and I came back to, to live here on Bornholm, I started um, digging down into the history of Bornholm ceramics, which then becomes the history of Danish ceramics. We have three schools. The group of Danish potters, 
where Gude Eriksen was a teacher that graduated from the academy in Aarhus. And then there is the school in Copenhagen. The Royal Porcelain Factory in Copenhagen always had ceramic artists working there in the factory, which has played a big role to Danish ceramics. And then there is the potters on Bornholm that has got their roots in the Yard factory. And one important woman, her name is Gertrud Vesegård. She has made a big influence on Danish ceramics. Actually, she's said to be um, you know, the roots of what we're all working on now. When I worked in Wales, Phil asked me if I wanted to do a lecture on Danish contemporary ceramics. I didn't know many Danish potters at that time. So it gave me a possibility to ring up people and ask, could I borrow pictures of your work? So I had a chance to, to meet Danish potters. I also phoned um, Gude Eriksen. She worked with Bernard Lees. And it's, it's so funny when I, when I called her. You know, at this, I'm an animator and I'm living here in Bornholm and I'm doing this lecture. And she sent me a whole box full of material, catalogues and, and interviews she did in America at some point. And she, we spent half an hour on the phone. Um, she, she, you know, I got a little embarrassed because she said, but uh, where do you use, where do you, where do you go and dig the clay? Do you know the clay here? And the clay is, is very good at this point on Bornholm. And, but, but are you not using it? And you, she just, she just, she was all into the process, you know, when I said Bornholm. Um, she, she has come here to dig a lot of clay. And actually there's a farmer who's got a private beach with lots of good clay. And he's got quite a collection of her work uh, because they, you know, they've swapped. I go and take clay for my glazes and my slips, and that's where I use the local clay from the beach, the beautiful red clay. I could just use iron oxide, but I think it's a good excuse to get out of my workshop. So I use this clay not for making, but I use it in glazes. Um, it's a beautiful red terracotta clay. It doesn't fire to a very, very high temperature. But it, 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 I use it in the S glazes. It, it gives a very nice color, you know, from the iron, of course. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting with this clay, actually, because you got this amazing green color here, and then you have this red clay it's all from the same ore but as i understand then uh, the red clay is underneath the green clay if you look up here and it's simply because the red clay you know this has been here millions of years and during the time there's been running water through the lower part of the clay which has oxidized it so it's the same clay it's just you know like uh, you know, when iron rusts, it, it, it goes red. But, so you don't get this color when it's fire. Sadly enough, because it's so beautiful, the green color. For me, it takes time to get to know clay, surfaces, shapes, and it's a, it's a lot about seeing, I think. Some things don't catch your interest, but then something does. You just get deeper and deeper into it, you know, all of a sudden you see it. When I sit here making these cylinders, you know, it's just a cylinder, but it's, it's an oval dish, and I can spend the whole day, it's my favorite, sitting here and just making bowls, lots of bowls, 
or lots of little oval cylinders, lots of cups, and just play around with the um, proportions. You know, 300 grams of clay, just a little lump of clay, and you make lots of little cylinders. And then when they are leather hard, I shape them, and it changes the whole thing so much, you know, just the way that you have played around with the proportions, you know, if you put the line just a little tiny bit like more like this or like this, or it just changes the whole shape. And that, that's interesting. And when you make a handle or you make a foot rim, um, it's, a, it's all the little details. And then that combining with the way you fire. It's, it's to put all the chapters into, into a story. If, if you read a really interesting book, or an exciting book, or a, you know, you, you just can't leave it again till, till you finish, and it, it, it never finishes. And the same, I think, it is for me when I look at a bowl, or a cup, or a cylinder, or something for use. It just, it just, it just stays there, and you can, you know, you keep reading the book again and again, and you find something new in it. So it's the same with pots, I think. It's a very good thing to have your workshop at home because you have to do things when the clay has got the right consistency. So you just have to always you know, take good care of the clay. It's like your grandmother, you can't leave her alone. She needs care all the time. Little old cylinder. For me, I think it's it's a little bit about beauty. Um, I like beautiful things. I I need to be surrounded by beautiful things, and beauty, of course, is you know it it it's different from each person. And it's not that I say I make beautiful things, but I, I try the best I can. You know, it's just mud, it's just clay. And um, fire and quartz and ash, wood ash, and, and very basic materials. But it's very fascinating that from those basic materials, that you can create beautiful work, beautiful pots for use. I make my own stamps. I just have a lump of clay and then I carve out uh, patterns. I stamp the surface when the piece is still quite wet, but it needs to be hard enough for this stamp not to stick. I think I, I quite like the repetition. It kind of does something interesting. It picks up the salt in the firing, so it kind of emphasizes the decoration, and I like that. It's kind of one story. You know, I, I just do the same thing with the porcelain bowls. They've got a glaze on, so it's a different story, but it's kind of the same where the glaze run into the little pool here. It goes a dark green, and when there's like a little top, the porcelain comes through. I like quiet pots, I think. Making quiet pots, because it's going to be food in here, and that's going to take a lot of attention, hopefully. Being a woman wood firer, yeah, at least for me, it. Uh, 
I don't do it on my own. Um, I've shared workshop with another woman, uh, a Swedish uh, ceramic artist called Ancelot Olsen, and we always fire together. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't um, be a wood fire uh, if I was going to do all this work on my own. If you get good reduction, you get beautiful, beautiful colors. But if you have too much reduction, or if you don't clean the atmosphere, you can get nasty surfaces. Fire needs oxygen burning. And if we can't take the oxygen from the air because we put too much firewood in there, then fire takes oxygen from the clay. And that changes the color. So you want to look into the kiln to check the, uh, the reduction, but as soon as you open just a little bit, you get air inside. So You also look at these little holes with drilled in the arts. You know, if the little flames coming out, it means it's a pressure. It's good. But you need to, you know, we need to burn down the wood to get clean atmosphere. And then the temperature rises and then we stoke again. So we have to find the rhythm. In a salt kiln, if you don't have good reduction, you have base. And we don't like base. So if you get good reduction, you have chestnut, reddish, brown. Sometimes you get little mother of pearlish surfaces. And that, that's beautiful. But it's difficult. Okay, Ancelot, nu tror jeg, at vi skal første kammer. So we're going to stoke in this one now. With salt glazing, decoration happens in the kiln. This bowl is stoneware clay and it has just got a kaolin slip. I've just brushed that on and then it's placed in the kiln with another bowl inside. And then I stack this one inside the other bowl. Um, and there's another one stacked on top of that. And then it goes into the kiln. So where a lot of flame comes and with the fire, I put salt in and put it in the kiln when I reach high temperature. And the salt vaporizes and the natrium combines with the silicium from the clay and it turns into a glaze. Um, but where in the bottom of this bone, you know, it's been hidden away, it's not much flame or salt can get into this part that's protected from the other bone. So it's a little drier and also it's got another color. So the decoration happens in the firing. That's very interesting because you've got a colleague then and it's a big challenge because you have to learn from that and try to do the best you can to get beauty from what the kiln can offer you. Um, and that's also a big responsibility because you use a lot of firewood and you use a lot of clay and when you turn clay into ceramics you, know, you can't go back again and we've got enough things in this world um, so of course you have to think really carefully when you put something into the kiln. In Danish you would say so you need to how would you translate that? You need to pay honest attention uh, to what you're doing in life. It, it sounds a little deep, but you, you, know, you have to drink a glass of wine, red wine also in between. But um, I think actually it is like that. And it's difficult. It's very difficult. And I'm not struggling because it's difficult, but I'm trying to do the best I can. And many times it's not good enough because 
It's so annoying if you have a really good piece coming out from the kiln and it's a bad shape. Then it's my fault. Um, and you can't always control where you get the beautiful surfaces on which spot. So you just have to pay attention to what you put in the kiln. I think I also came back to live on Bornholm because there's a beautiful nature here. I don't think about it when I make work that I'm inspired by nature. I don't think about that literally. Um, but of course I do. Sometimes I, you know, I do look out the window or I'm standing looking at a beautiful tree. Sometimes it's the reverse, then uh, peace comes from the firing and, you know, it's, it's exactly the same colors um, than, you know, when, when it's winter and when it's just about to be sunset and there's a white, thick snow with a little bit of mud coming up through the snow and then you have the blue sky and then you have this pinkish orange starting you know, in the horizon. And then you say, whoa, that's strange because that's just what's on the piece. So, you know, I, it, it doesn't always just go one way. It, it's, it's, it's nature, isn't it? So they just sometimes meet in funny ways. I know I'm fortunate to find a way in life where I, you know, life goes too fast. Time goes too fast. Um, time goes too fast and on the other hand when you're working with clay it's a slow life because you can't force anything. Ceramic pots take time. But it's, it is an, it's an ongoing learning experience um, and it's, it's enough for me. It's a challenge, but it's a great challenge. educate, entertain our customers. Okay, so now we're going to look at some other of his prints. We're thinking very seriously about stopping making pots. There's nothing forced and I think his jugs are, are really the epitome of that. Hello, welcome to today's broadcast from the Goldmark Gallery. One of my most regular places to visit up in this part of the world is the Goldmark Gallery. 